Right, morning guys. So, um, I'll give you a bit of an update on the um, liners. Now, obviously, I've been measuring them, and the as I showed you in the last video of the liners, um, they all appear to be 73mm as they're supposed to be. Um, I've since got myself a micrometer, which is a lot, lot more accurate than a vernier is, because um, you basically wind it in, and it stops exactly at the correct clearance, not too tight, not too loose. And basically, um, it's going to show the difference of why a micrometer is better, which includes the fact that a micrometer, the points in which that have taken the measurement are the same size as that, whereas the vernier is a small, like, almost like a ruler's thickness, and they can sit at any point on that face there. And the trouble is, that face there, you might be able to see it, I don't know, is basically rounded, so that then you have a point that then goes into the furthest point on the inside of the bore because obviously the bore itself is round so you need a point to be able to stick out onto the furthest point away and this was a slight mistake I made when I last measured them so um, I've found out on the micrometer just how worn these liners are well number one is kind of actually up to rest yet but from what I found on liner one um, we need liners so just from the top here that little line all the way around that edge that is actually the um, the wear basically so if you put your finger on that you can actually feel a nice little ridge and what I'm now going to do is show you with the micrometer and the tool that you use to measure um, just how worn these are so generally speaking the manual states that if the engine is still in the car and you're checking the liners then up to 0.25 mil is acceptable to get away with it and just stick some new rings in it. If the engine's out the car and basically there's no point being silly, you just go to every length you can to make sure it goes back in as a good build. And they say that the tolerance you really want to head for is 0.127 of a mil, so basically 0.12-0.13 area. So with this out the car, we want it to be as good as we damn well can because there's no point assembling an engine that's going to be knackered when it goes back in. So this is where the bad news starts unfortunately. So um, in a engine, this one particular, you remember that I said we had piston slap. Now I thought personally, going by a bit of experience on what I've managed to do with other engines that I've overheated, um, that basically the piston rings had melted which would then cause them not to be perfectly square and then they're not going to be um, guiding the piston up and down square they're going to be f letting it do that which is where the slap comes out of it um, basically when I've measured this um, you have to measure it at basically every single angle you can at all different heights up and down the stroke so if I show you the bottom half again let's find it shall we I've wrapped it in cling film because cling film provides a basic, a nice vacuum tight seal against the elements. Now, if you look there, you can see what will do different colours at the bottom end here where my leg is. The bottom half where you can set a different colour is where it was honed originally and the piston doesn't actually reach there because it's beyond its stroke region. Just above that is where the stroke starts and basically roughly from about there to there is its stroke so what we do is we take measurements with this all angles we can or all, all straight angles basically side to side like that all the way down and then we find where's where's got worn where hasn't and basically you're looking for nice equal wear all the way down because if say you've got an area that's wider than the rest then that's going to allow a piston to have that wobble because it's obviously not it's not going to be as tight it's not going to have the guidance if that makes sense and what i found is part way down the stroke um where at the top it starts at about 0.05 mil which is absolutely brilliant really um when you get to sort of the bottom end of the stroke we go out to as far as about 0.33 of a mil so in that respect where i found the piston rings were not were still nice and square I believe the actual problem is the fact that these liners appear to have just gone oval and what's effectively happening is if you imagine having um, imagine having a tube like that supposed to be dead straight both sides with two parallel lines but then basically the middle of it eggs outwards like that making it sort of an oval shape and then imagine a piston trying to go up and down that perfectly straight but halfway up there's absolutely no support so 
whereas at the top it's tight and maybe at the bottom it's tight the middle of it is sort of like that that's where the piston slap's coming from in this engine so um yeah it's not great <laughs> so what i've had to do consequently is um a noose with that one alone being like that um it means that you're gonna need a new liner because that's that's how you do it on these particular engines. You could bore it out and you could get another piston, but that's not gonna that's gonna be as expensive as just getting four new liners. And that's where the problem sort of comes in for me at the moment. Because um basically a set of liners for this engine, which come with a set of rings, gudgeon pin and a new piston as well, it all comes with a full four set for to just go back in the engine, um you're looking at over three hundred pounds and as much as I hate to say it, um, that's really out of my budget. If I'm honest, I was I was kind of um, really hoping for it just to be a new set of rings and happy days, but sadly, it's not quite the case. So consequently, um, I'm having to figure out other ideas that I can come up with to get around this small problem. Right, so you might have seen this engine in the previous shot I've just taken. Well, I'm just going to explain what we're doing with it. So basically. Um, Back in August when I thought that the engine I had was basically toast, couldn't understand what I was overheating, um, a friend of mine who's been in the Renault scene for quite a number of years, has quite a few contacts, and one of them has seen the 10 go from what I got it as to what it is now, and basically he said, I've got this spare engine, if it's any use to you, it, you're more than welcome to have it. So I've taken him up on the offer, um, because obviously I need some liners for mine and we don't entirely know what condition this one's in we just know it came out of a working running car that was just obviously a bit past it and so they had to be scrapped I think but um, what I'm going to do is um, to start off I've put a bit of diesel and some clean fresh oil in the sump I hadn't got anything in it when I got it at all so I've put a bit of both in because obviously it thins it out a bit and makes it a bit easier the fact that it's really cold at the moment and the fact we know that there's likely to be build up of crap inside it so that should hopefully help things out a little bit you might be thinking how would you to do any tests on this engine like i'm in, intending to going to do a compression test and see how that comes back and then we're going to see if it runs and how well it runs um but obviously to do that you need to be able to start it or at least turn it over on starter so where are we going to bolt it to well this is where this bit of trickery comes in and basically what we do is um, this is a Mark 1 5 bell housing it just bolts on there it just hasn't got the gearbox which would normally be mounted on the end here what we're going to do is bolt that on bolt my starter on and then we can get the battery hook it up take the plugs out and do a compression test see what comes back and depending on what the compression test comes back with um, we might try and see if, see if it runs and how well it runs so yeah, hopefully with any luck um, we might be able to use we might be able to use some bits from this engine to make a good one out of what we've got so yeah let's see how we get on right so we're in this position now we've got the barrels on the starter on what I've just done is put taking the earth lead off of the body of the car and just put it on the main main feed and the side feed of course I'm uh, just having it cranking over a bit and it doesn't sound too bad honestly. I've got this off so I can see if maybe how, when any if, if, um, all starts getting up to the top. So I'll give you, let you have a listen. So now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put the compression tester in. I should actually add, um, I took all the plugs out so it's got as little resistance on it as possible. Um, just to mean we could make sure it definitely cranks over nicely so um, yeah um, now I'm going to put the compression test in each one and see what we come back with right so I'm doing the compression testing and so far we're up to number two and they're both saying the same thing which is what it's reading right now absolutely zilch so what I'm going to do is uh, result to plan B um, scrap the compression testing let's just try and fire it up shall we right so we're at the stage now where I'm just going to explain to you this is what I absolutely love about an old old car so on a new car you've got an ECU you've got injection you've got electric ignition everything is all simultaneously working together 
and without the little computer module it's a complete waste of a lump of anything you can't do a thing with it old cars on the other hand distributor here that takes care of all the ignition side of things and then the carburetor here takes control of all the fuel side of things you need both of them to make the engine work but neither has any effect on the other apart from this pipe here that changes the um, ignition at high revs apart from that these two both work independently to each other so all you've got to do is um, I've just taken this distributor out of the box over there so this one no works because the points in this one one side's actually just broken off the points completely so it's not really much use to me at the moment and it's also a little bit seized up so drop my distributor in uh, my call's sitting down there the original one's sitting up there obviously um, I've just poured some um, just cut this pipe and it's just poured some petrol down that and then also poured a little bit straight down the venturi and what we're going to do is um, you just connect up the 12 volt feed to the positive side of the coil high tension side low tension side as he goes to the points and then what we're going to do is crank it over and see if we can get any life out of it so yeah that is what i absolutely adore about an old engine it is so easy to start one up on the floor because you've got no computers in your way absolutely love it right so we've now got a bit of fuel coming through on the old accelerator jet this uh, brass pipe to the side here so operate that you can just see it trickling through there we go um, it's going to shut the choke flap off by doing this which just basically restricts the amount of air going and makes the mixture ultra rich oh it's far over doing the it anyway then we have to put the battery on see if we can get it to start up right well we gave up with the other carburetor because it was just absolutely hopeless it just was not working at all however it's just run This, wouldn't it? To wind me up. Just try it out. Let's try something. It did just run. I'll put some more petrol in the uh, float chamber and try again. Right, let's try this again, shall we? Definitely started a minute ago. Alright, try the valve the ignition and try to see if that helps us at all. Oh, that's why! Ignition wire came off, that be why it did it. <laughs> This should helps a lot, strangely enough. I have no idea why. See if that helps, shall we? Nice little ignition wire on. Let's try retarding it back off to where it was before.
Okay, so you're probably wondering what the hell the rocket cover's doing off. Let me do a bit of explaining now. We did two compression tests once I got it running. The first one was after it ran for about five or six seconds and the compression went up to 150 on all cylinders. Number two was struggling to get there, but it did get there. Run it a bit longer and actually held it on the um, revs a little bit. So it got a good bit of circulation and good bit of working for the engine. And they've all gone up to 200. Again, number two is a bit of a push, but they all reach 200 PSI. Okay, so we're just having a little look inside this uh, donor engine. Um, there was a noise that developed um, after the first initial video of basically giving it a bit of a run up. So I was revving it up. You might have heard on the, um, the shot where it when the phone went in my pocket for me to adjust the timing um, it had a really dodgy knock to it and um, didn't sound like piston slam it sounded too continuous to be that however rocking this big end up and down you can actually feel the play that's in number three you can actually feel a lot quite a bit of play up and down that little knock there is literally that one there just knocking up and down. If we move around to this one. That's a, can't get out of that one. We spin the engine around a little bit so we can get to number one and four. Which way around does it want to spin that way? That'll do. Again. There we go. You can actually see that one moving up and down against the crankshaft. Look. So I reckon that's probably what that ruddy, awful noise was. Personally speaking, it would make sense if it was basically just all the big ends doing that. So it probably means that the, um, there was perhaps a little bit of dirt in the oil galleries inside the crank, and as it's been run a bit longer, they've also just potentially just starved themselves of oil and um, effectively just worn the um, material out on the shell bearing inside so we'll take the caps off and have a quick look and see what we find because of course we don't actually know any facts until we um, take things apart and have a look for ourselves what's, what, what it tells us so we'll do that next and um, see what we find Alright, well we've um, each, and, each and every one of them so far has had a little bit of um, wear on the shell and this one, which is number four, is evidently the worst. Almost looks like someone's been putting some shingle inside it and then letting the engine run with it in there. The only evidence of it you can see on this is just beside there, look, that mark there. That's the only mark I've actually found so far. I haven't actually tried to rotate it yet, though, so I suspect there'll be more. Okay, so if the camera decides to focus, any luck, there we go, um, you'll see that is number five. Let me go to number four, and that is by far the worst crankshaft bearing shot I've ever seen before. Where it's actually pitted to support where some of the material was actually come off and was actually stuck to the crankshaft journal itself. Then we go to number three, and again, lovely great big score in it. Number two, another score. And number one, covered in scores. So, um, yeah. Okay, so this is um, just showing you the crankshaft itself. Um, that is main bearing number five, and it's got a lovely few dents that my finger can drop into, scores or scratches rather. Uh, that is big end number four, and there's actually a few that, like scratches you can see just there. And again, you can actually see that in the shell bearings. Uh, main bearing number three. You can see different colours, well, that's where the um, pitting and surface rust was between the two. And as it started and spun around, it's just basically cleaned itself up. But, um, as I showed you in a video beforehand, um, it had a nice bit of, um, when it was on the big ends, you could actually feel those play in the big ends, which is where the almighty knocking was coming from. So, yeah. Uh, they've all got a little bit of scoring, and as you can see, that was actually covered in surface rust resemblance um, that one there is actually not too bad the shell took the worst of it um, but this lot up this end as you can see scored to death to be quite frank and that one there as you can see is absolutely covered in where surface rust has been so yeah this crank is definitely nowhere near as good as my one which um, 
from what I found on inspection only needs the main bearings ground back so I think we'll be abandoning this crankshaft but um won't be binning it because um you never know might someone might be really desperate and actually need it and not mind really going for it so yeah never mind Right, so as I showed you, the um, big ends had a little bit of play in them, and I could literally pull them around like that, couldn't I? As you saw in the video. Um, this is number four. Uh, yeah, that could explain a lot. And um, yeah, if you ever look on the uh, crank video, um, you'll actually see where some of the pitting was actually on the crank yard as well. So yeah, it was almost as though someone's dumped some shingle between the two and let it run. Quite insane, really. But yeah. That's the worst of them. The rest of them are just sort of you can just basically see where it's worn all the way, all the surface of the shallow eye. But um, that one there has got a, quite a nice score in it, in fact. But yeah, as you can see, um, yeah, these shells are definitely dead. <laughs> but uh, yeah, any hey, luck? The uh, we, as I said, we um, we got 200 psi out of these, so um, fingers crossed, these should be okay to. Um, Put back in my block and then with a new set of shells get my crankshaft reground so it's all okay on the main bearing side of things and I think it should all be okay, fingers crossed.